have the questions at the end of the seminar, please use the microphones. Um, hold the touch button down with the red light lit as you're asking your question so the people who are watching on the web can hear the question. Um, and if there is no microphone near you, we're gonna, we can walk over with this portable one. Um, so, okay, there we go. Uh, there, okay, <laughs> so welcome everyone. My name is Jennifer Dell. I'm a faculty member here in Urban Studies and Planning, and along with my colleagues, Rob Bertini and Chris Monsier, we help co-organize uh, this uh, weekly uh, transportation seminar. And so today we have with us uh, Mark Gishard, formerly with Metro, currently now actually a field engineer with TriMet. So there's a lot of civil engineering students here. Maybe afterwards uh, might want to talk with you about that experience. But uh, today he's going to be talking about a project that he worked on uh, in his uh, previous responsibilities uh, dealing with multiple things, but parking at regional centers. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. And you can uh, also, if you want to tell anything more about yourself. Okay, am I on? Can people hear me? Okay. Yeah. yeah the, okay. Yeah. So, hi, I think I took physics with you last year. I've, I've been going, something like that, I've been taking uh, engineering classes here for about three years part-time to become a civil engineer. Uh, a, short, a short bio on myself, I started about 15 years ago, I came to the region um, and got involved as a growth management activist for 1,000 Friends of Oregon when they were working on the LUTRAC study and, and very interested in sort of that smart, smart growth agenda. Um, from there, I, I moved to TriMet as a station area planner for the west side um, and then became a little more technical when I came to, went to Metro and started doing what they call joint development, which is what the Federal Transit Administration calls transit-oriented development at light rail stations. Um, that's their technical term for that. And I helped run a program there for about 10 years where we essentially bought land on the open market and then found developers and work to in increase density and mixed uses. Uh, and now I've, I've, I've gone almost full circle to technical and I'm a field engineer building the, the green line uh, out on I-205 I and that's a six and a half mile line and it includes everything from a uh, four story, 600 car parking garage and transit center down to Clackamas Town Center, uh, eight stations, a bunch of green infrastructure like bioswales and stuff. Um, PED improvements, bike improvements. So it's, I've, I've sort of had a, a transition from uh, policy and activism to, to technical, which is a little backwards, I think, from, from most people. But it's, it's keeping me entertained. While I was at Metro, um, I became very interested in, in parking and, and all of its various uh, ramifications. So what I'm going to talk today about is I'm going to touch on what we think a regional center is and some of the key metrics that I've looked at there. Uh, why is an alternative mode guy like me talking about auto parking um, specifically? Uh, and then launch into a, a project I was on in Hillsborough and Beaverton that, that dealt with parking strategies out there. Um, and that essentially entailed a business owner survey uh, where a lot of the business owners said, hey, we have a parking problem out here. So the study went out and we did some sort of on the ground parking demand uh, surveys and thank you very much. We found there actually wasn't a parking problem, there was a parking management problem. Um, so the, a consultant came on and came up with some key recommendations on what Hillsborough and Beaverton can do about that and they're in the process of implementing that. Why I started talking about this is I think what's going on there is very applicable outside of those two areas and especially in a more planning uh, role in, in education, I think parking needs to be elevated up to the level of um, policy talk and, and infrastructure that we're now talking about things like uh, all sorts of uh, TDM, bike and ped as a real form of transportation, um, carpooling. It's, it's, it's a part of the infrastructure and I think we should be talking about it that way. Um, that I have a few suggestions for further study. So where are Beaverton and Hillsborough? Many of you might know. Um, Hillsborough's at the far western end of the Portland region. Beaverton's about a third of the way out. Um, here's, here's downtown Portland. And what Metro said a regional center is, is uh, there's seven of them in the region. 
uh, in addition to the central city. So everybody knows what the function of the central city is. It is the cultural business uh, population headquarters for the city, for the region. Uh, the regional center is the idea behind it. It's the next tier down. So they're very, it's supposed to be very dense, very compact, packed, mixed use, and hooked together with uh, high quality transit. So uh, we are in the process of, of bringing our light rail lines and commuter lines down and around our various regional centers. Um, key, key metrics. Some of the things I've been looking at, and this is why a person who's been focusing on alternative modes is now dealing with parking. Uh, back in 1994, Metro did a pretty comprehensive travel survey. And it looked at areas all around the region. And what they found, that in areas of mixed use with high, co high quality transit, which is a, essentially a regional center, they found a, a mode split for transit going from about 1.2 up to 11. So that says when you mix high, high quality transit with mixed uses, you get this tr tremendous mode split. And so we started working on bringing mixed uses into places where we have high quality transit. But what started to captivate me is this there, these things over here. When you have this, you get a 230% increase in your non-auto mode share. So that's people um, getting out of their cars and biking and especially walking um, up to a 41.9% mode share for non-auto. That is significant. Um, even more interesting is VMT is going down significantly and auto ownership is going down. So what we're finding out is if you can create a area where you have high, high quality transit options and a mixed use uh, land use environment, you start to see these things happen. Now we are not advocating, in spite of what people say, that we want to get rid of people and we want to get rid of their cars. Especially we are trying to create transportation options for people at, at Metro. And so the idea of creating this sort of environment what happens is then you have a car storage problem because now you know people still have cars, but they're using other modes and they need to store those cars some, somewhere. So uh, parking becomes an integral part of the mixed use environment. And how we dealt with that in, in Todd for 10 years is we had some very uh, good ideas. Um, here's a project I worked on out in Hillsborough. Um, here and our, our solution here was just to have a very low parking ratio. This was about 23 apartments and it had I think uh, 13 parking spaces and that worked well for the people who live there at the station. But that doesn't work for everybody. So another thing we tried to do out here in Beaverton where we had the station up here and the old historic, excuse me this is out in, in, in Gresham, the historic downtown here we were trying to create a mixed use corridor and we put this building in and it's a little more upscale so people wanted parking so here we use what we call tuck under parking which is essentially putting it behind the building and putting it under half the building. This is a very cost effective way to increase densities in say a, a, a two to three story building, provide some parking and also maintain a real pedestrian environment. Um, in a four or five story building where we also want to have some pedestrian environment, we use what's called a podium. And what a podium is, is you come in and you build a concrete structure and you park on the ground floor and you build a residential unit above. This is a, a very effective way and you can get densities, uh, the, the density at this project was about 190 units to the acre um, the parking ratio turned out to be about 0.7 per spaces per, per unit. So it's, it, it's a really good mix. Um, and just as an aside, th this is a very cost effective building environment um, or, or building system because for mixed use. Because what we're doing here is we're essentially tacking on a commercial. What you often have when you try to mix commercial and residential and, and, and parking is it's, you end up elevating the, the, the parking garage up to say 19 feet, so this can become what they call Class A, which is your highest rents um, and your most desirable retail. But that means you have to jack your, your concrete parking garage up to about nine, 
19 feet, and that is very expensive and wasteful. So if you just tack the commercial on, um, have your parking below and your residential above, this is, works very well for a six or story uh, style building. And then your last choice, of course, is, 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 is putting it underground, which is what we did out in uh, Gresham again, where we have a, a transit station right here, and the site we're looking at is that one on the far, on the far side. So we stuck uh, the parking underground. But this costs about $30,000 a space. Um, so very nice way to go, but you need pretty strong market economics or a really big government checkbook to make that work. So I'm just wrapping that up by saying Todd solutions work really well with new construction and when development economics are hot. Um, what about existing districts and emerging areas like the historic areas of downtown Beaverton and downtown Hillsborough? These are areas that were built up, say, from the 20s through the 1960s. A lot of them are, I, I think I have a mis misplaced uh, question mark up there. Sorry about that. Um, these are areas that were built up in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 40s, usually one story. Um, didn't have a lot of parking to begin with and have moved into sort of uh, now trying to revitalize. And they're... They're pretty spread out. So what do we do in those sorts of areas where you can't just build a parking garage at $30,000 a space, or you're not looking at new construction where you can tuck it in or put it under or uh, those other things. So here's, here's the area of downtown Beaverton that we looked at. And I like to use this called a figure ground where the buildings are in black and everything else is in, in white. And you can get a very good idea of the kind of uh, building intensity here. And you can see it's pretty sp spread out. Small buildings um, and large parking lots, especially up, up in this area. Um, not very dense. And this is where they were saying, the business owners were saying they had a parking problem. Same thing in, da in downtown Hillsboro. Uh, lots of small buildings, lots of spaces between buildings. Um, so what are you going to do? This study in particular was a transportation growth management study sponsored by the state of Oregon. This is a, a program that's been around since 1991 with the advent of ICE-T, uh, and it funds projects ar around the state that help with growth management and, tra and transportation issues. Uh, the, the study in particular that we ran here was about uh, $104,000. Um, 89 of that was paid for by the state, and each city came up with about 7.5. Uh, the project was run concurrently in these, in these two towns um, for co cost effective, so we could share consultants and share staff and, and, and share duplication and mailing and that sort of stuff. But it, it was run with local committees of citizens and building owners, and, and that was sort of a key thing that really worked well because uh, we, we got sort of the economy of scale of, of uh, a larger project, but we were sitting there with the people and everything we talked about in those committee meetings were relevant to them. They weren't worrying about what was going on in, in the other town. And, and that was a really good idea. So uh, I would recommend doing that if you're ever in a position of running this kind of study. Uh, three main tasks, document the existing conditions, uh, as I say, vetting through a, through a diverse stakeholder group and then teeing up some implementa implementation through actual uh, adoption of codes. So um, what I'm going to run through now is, is, is sort of an overview of that study uh, and, and then deal with some of the sp specific findings. So just in, in review, the business owners, you can see good participation. 500 people responded. 89% um, response rate in Beaverton. Um, a lot of people drive SOVs, 82%, 81 um, And this is their perception of, of how far people will walk to their businesses, one block. And the result of this was essentially it's getting harder and harder for my customers to find parking. So they saw there was a real parking problem in those areas. And this is pretty common, I think, in most uh, downtown, old, old downtowns, they will say there's a parking problem if people have to walk more than a block. 
Um, so what this study did is we went out and we actually said, so let's look at the parking. Um, we mapped all the on-street and off-street parking. Picked a typical day. In this case, it was December 9th of 06. Uh, we documented the hourly occupancy from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. So every space was counted uh, when people came, when, when people left. Pretty intensive. There was about uh, between 20 and 40 interns w working on that project. So uh, pretty labor intensive. Um, and it was all done by tracking license plates. Yes, sir. So did you document turnover then too, rather than just whether there's a car there or not, yes, but did. also whether it's a fresh car? Yes, and I'll, I, I have a, f a few results. So by far, this study is really what captivated my interest in this study. This is some really great information, and it, it can be used in all sorts of ways. Um, so now I'm going to run, run through some results. Uh, 7,500 spaces in Hills in Hillsboro, which is the key point there, um, and then it was broken down by exactly how those were. Uh, average length of stay, you know, I, we're going to start getting into what you want now. You know, two hours and two minutes, um, and I think this is, do I have the turnover rate here? Some people are, you know, no enforcement out there in these small towns. So lots of people are av violating. Here's the average turnover for Hillsborough. This shows by hour a day. And what's most fascinating about this slide here is this idea of the 85% rule. Um, the consultant that worked on this, his name is Rick Williams, and he's worked for a long time in the private industry, uh, office parks, shopping centers. And th it, for a long time, they've used this idea of the 85% rule, which essentially says if you have 85% of, of your parking stalls filled, you have a parking problem. If you don't, you don't have a parking problem. And you can see out here in, in Hillsborough, you know, Never really anywhere close to that at all. This is where it starts to get interesting. The great thing about this study is it, it had actual data on really specific sites. So there are some areas you can go in and look at some nodal places. And there are a few areas where you're approaching that 85% rule. Now, in this study, we use these nodal areas to sort of identify where there might be parking issues. What someone else could do, if you're, say, an urban planner or a redevelopment specialist, this identifies your 100% corner, which is, is that idea of where people want to be, you know, where that activity is. You can go into a downtown, do this kind of analysis, and automatically you know where your 100% corners are. And if you're trying to figure out where you might want to start some redevelopment issues, this tells you, you know, Look at this area. This is where people are actually trying to get to. Um, you know when they're trying to get there. My slide just changed auto auto automatically. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, looking at Beaverton, we start to see the same thing. Here we have 2,000 off-street parking spaces. 85% uh, rule, nowhere close. Beaverton parking demand, actual turnover rate, 4.2. And again, here's an idea of, we use this for our purposes here, but again, your turnover rate that you were talking about, very important. When you start to see relatively high turnover rates, you know you have a really active retail district. So again, these types of studies have ramifications and in, in uses far outside of, of, of just parking. Here's some, we looked at some nodes out there. Again, nowhere near 85%. So what I want you to see is that there really wasn't a parking issue, except for in a, in a very few small spaces. And uh, we, we, we started picking up on that. So actual built supply to actual demand. This, I think, is probably the most important slide and the most interesting. What we did here is, is we looked at um, 
how much parking supply there is and how many spaces per actual building requirements. So out here in Hillsborough, the city's requiring 3.0 spaces per thousand square feet. The market is producing an actual demand 1.6. So that means the city's actually requiring almost twice what the market is demanding. Downtown Portland, that number is 1.4. In Kirkland, that number is 1.98. So what we saw is, is this um, situation where we have development regulations in place that are requiring us to build more parking, create a, a more sprawled out, less compact environment, when the actual demand is only half that. So clearly we started looking at what are we going to do for a plan now? Because there's this idea there's a parking problem. There might be some isolated areas of a parking problem. But let's start putting this down on paper. So what is a strong parking management plan? It manages supply, enforces parking policies, monitors and responds to changes in demand. A good parking management plan is a dynamic plan, and um, that's a, a, a key point. So what they wanted to do out there is they created a, essentially a parking czar. And this is a, a person who will implement this plan over time. And it's, it's one person who can uh, coordinate the studies, advocate for a strong management parking plan, talk to business owners. Um, and start pushing this idea through of, of actually codifying a parking management plan. Uh, just going to move on here. They're putting in, in the code adopting the 85% rule. That's a key finding in this study, is getting the idea of having cities have some mechanism in place where they can monitor when their parking demand reaches that 85% rule, and then they know it's time to do something. So it's not just a once in a time study. It's, it's actively going out and, and, and finding those areas where you're starting to approach that threshold, and then planning to figure out how you're going to solve that parking issue when it arrives. This is totally. They had a lot of one hour, four hour. People can't like figure out what's going on. It's like they, they, they come to Beaverton and they have no idea. It's like, can I park here for one hour? Can I park there? So their, their recommendation was just eliminate it all and, and, and sort of standardize it. Um, longer term. This was a, a, you know, this report had a bazillion recommendations. So I'm not running through all of it. I, I just wanted to touch on a few of what I see as the highlights. Develop incentives to encourage private sector-led strategies. Again, this, is, this was a, a community-based effort. And it gets back to that or original idea of stakeholders in the room going through this process, realizing that we might have a problem, but realizing that they need to get involved in the solution. Uh, very key, very, very good idea. The idea of wayfinding became very captivating to a lot of the business owners. People said, I, if I don't have that parking right in front of my building, people don't know where to come to downtown Beaver, don't know where to come to downtown Hillsborough and, and, and park. So one idea uh, coming out of this study is, is to develop over time a, a broad-based wayfinding and marketing plan that both the city and the, and the businesses can work together. This is probably my top third thing is this idea of the, cu of the customer first policy. This is something that I, I think you'll start to see a lot more of. And in a lot of these areas where especially they have parking right in front with no enforcement, the employees are parking there all day. Um, and so of course customers can't, can't find parking. 
So one of the key points here is instigating a customer first policy. And, and this is a, a aggressive effort on the business owners to educate their employees not to park in front, not to park in the street, to work with other property owners to designate maybe parking spaces uh, in, the, in the back parking lot somewhere so that those what they call teaser spaces, which are those parking spaces, everyone cruises by the place they're going by and you know, you're looking for that parking spot right in front, you're hoping for it, that's called the teaser space. And retail districts know that the teaser space is essential. People actually have to believe that they might get those. And so that you don't, you, you don't want employees parking there. And a, and a customer first policy over time can keep those available and let, let people know that they're always going to be a, able to find parking where they're headed. Implementation progress to date. Now this is a, a neat plan. Um, it's not moving along quietly as fast as we had hoped. Um, Hillsborough, as of December, had a report adopted by council. Um, they, they both have in their, in their budget to have the parking czar and starting to get that. They have the beginnings of a um, outreach program and, and starting to work on that customer first policy. Uh, Beaverton, in particular, is, is starting on, on a wayfinding program. Uh, that's going to wrap around from probably the library to where the Beaverton Farmer's Market is and down through the historic downtown and over to where the round is um, and sort of tying that whole area together, which makes a lot of sense. Um, and the staff has prepared an, an ordinance to sort of codify these things, um, but it's, it's, it's getting bogged, bogged down a little. So, so these things definitely take some time. Lessons learned. Accept the need for parking management. When I first started getting into this, I thought this was going to be just sort of an extra. That, but you know, I'm pretty convinced that cities, especially ones that are trying to revitalize those, those older areas, need to start thinking about parking management. Um, that idea of that annual survey to identify the 100% corner or to identify where the 85% rule is, essential. I, I, I really think cities should think about that. Um, and this is probably the most controversial idea coming out of the study is these areas, if you, if you remember those uh, first sketches that showed all the spaces between the buildings that are available and the fact that demand is half of what people are requiring, what the cities are requiring, we might want to move towards the idea of new development can come in with zero parking requirements. And that would be cheaper for them and start to fill up the spaces between buildings and without really affecting demand. If you have the management, if you have the wayfinding, if you have all these other things. This is probably the most uh, one of the biggest chances of how we can densify our regional centers uh, really co cost effectively. We can't go in and build parking structures and underground parking at fifteen to thirty thousand dollars a space. We could go in and temporarily uh, relieve people of, of, of building parking, allowing the density to come up, and then maybe in five or ten years start moving those parking requirements back in as the market has, has moved up and some of the structured parking options become more economically feasible. And then the, the, the customer first idea I think is key. So th that's pretty much what I had to say about parking. Um, if you want to know more, uh, The High Cost of Free Parking by Donald Shoup, Shoup uh, AIA Press in 2005. That's pretty much the key book. He's a professor down in, I think, UCLA. Uh, Breaking the Code uh, by a consultant named Jeffrey Tumlin. Um, he touches on a lot of these parking things in a nice little PDF that he put together that you can read online. Um, the TDM Encyclopedia from the Victoria Transportation Policy Institute is an outstanding online uh, resource for pretty much all ideas around T TDM. Uh, Rick Williams Consulting, again, was the lead consultant on these, on these two studies, and he's local, and he's key. And then um, you can follow up with 
with me if you like, and this is uh, my current w web address. So that's about all I had to say. Are there any questions? questions. Yes, sir. Now, you're not against on-street parking, right? You're, you're, no. You're, okay, so. No, I, I think it's, a, it's essential, especially those, those teaser spots. Okay, and now, but you, you did say, I think, that you thought the one to four hour were not viable. In, in, what in, in downtown them? Hillsboro, what they were saying, they don't have enforcement, first of all, out, out there. So that was tricky. But what people were saying is they couldn't figure out, um, if, if you go back to some of the studies where, he, where he, you look the turnover, they just found it was too confusing, too many zones. People were, were, were not, the, the average stay was a little, I think it was 2.4 hours or something. So it, it, it was just too much too confusing for people. Too many options. Yeah, why not just simplify it? T two hours on, on street, make it real clear. People know when they come to this area, two hours. Put in some wayfinding so they can find longer term parking sort of out of the prime areas. But um, don't have it uh, so confusing. Now, that, there were some um, real concerns about like the 15 minute zones for cleaners and stuff. And they, they still are allowing the uh, business owners to petition uh, the city for for those and and that's in the study as well. I just I just didn't didn't cover it But my basic point there is, is the idea of simplifying and being clear about what that you're that you're headed into a new parking zone and it, it, Make sure people can read what's going on clearly whatever it is you're doing uh, Do you have an idea in areas where minimum parking requirements were eliminated um, what type of parking ratios developers like to provide? In other words, what, what does the market like to provide as, as far as parking ratios when there is no requirement? Well, I can't tell you um, because most cities actually require parking to go in. What this study showed, though, is actual demand. I mean, we were out counting cars, and the actual demand in these areas was always under two per thousand square feet. So. Um, there's a few places around the Portland region where there are no parking requirements. Um, most developers end up putting in some some parking, but there's a few projects I can think of that they're like residential projects without any parking. Um, has to be pretty intense, though. Most most business owners are going to want some parking. I mean, even our in our wildest dreams at Metro or it's at their wildest dreams, I should say. Um, you know, we want to see mode splits of, like I was showing you, 40% for non-auto, 15% uh, for transit. Um, you know, so we're not trying to eliminate people from using cars. I mean, clearly, the, the, the personal auto is here to stay for a while, regardless of its propulsion um, system or its form, you know, we're, we're going to have to deal with, with, with parking for, for a long time, so, yeah. Uh, I, I don't, I don't quite understand your question. I, I think you're, you're asking, can, like uh, Fred Meyer shopping parking lots be used for other uses when the demand is, is, is not there for parking. Um, I would say yes, but in the case of you know, Fred Meyer, that's private property. So they're pretty reluctant to give up some of their spaces unless there's some benefit to them. Um, but it certainly can, can, can happen. Th there's a thing, and I, I think it's a Dutch word called a, a woonerf which is uh, auto areas that are clearly made for pedestrians to, to be king or the most important thing. So I, I can see more of that happening, where you start to have these, these parking plazas that work as maybe during the week as, as, as plazas or as parking, and then the weekends can, can be farmer's market stalls and stuff like that. And, and that's, that's certainly possible. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that you and then... And then um, given the nature of this area, my assumption is that the vast majority of the parking is going to be off-street. 
did this address any of that? Was there any shared parking between private parking lots? Or did this mostly focus on on-street parking? This study did both. We, we did a capacity, part of the capacity analysis was off-street. Um, uh, the hour-by-hour -hour turnover rate analysis was only on, only on street parking, but there was a occupancy um, demand look at all the all the parking. So off street was definitely included, um, and that was cal calculated into the oc oc occupancy rates, just not into the turnover rates. There was there was a slight methodolo methodology difference there. What was the, do you know if there were the ratio between on-street versus off-street parking, uh, what the difference in supplies were? Um, I think I have a slide on that, but I, I, I don't know if I brought it with me or not. Um, it, it, it was in the slides? Let's see if we can go back up here. I think it's here in, B, in, B, in Beaverton. Yeah, right here. Does that answer your question, uh, Private? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So you mentioned that this these studies started because the business owners felt that there was a parking problem, and yet they were well below the 85 percent rule. Are they feeling like they're seeing improvements with? Well, this? yes and no. Um, you know, part of that was just perception that people are hearing that they can't, their customers can't find parking within a block or two. And part of that reason was the employees, the, there were employees parking, there were people, you know, when people started focusing on, there, there were some be people who would park in a two-hour stall and then and move it to the adjacent two-hour stall, you know, I, there's a term for that, I forget what it's called, cheating, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, there's some initial, uh, Hillsborough's hiring an enforcement officer, you know. So yes, they, they are they are starting to see some differences, but there has to be that sort of multi-prong approach of a customer first policy, uh, clear signage, some enforcement, um, and and then and that way and that way finding so people know where else their parking is available, and that starts to whittle away at at that um, perception that that there's a parking problem. It was tremendously convincing to th the business owners uh, who walked through this process and it, it took about four months um, and as they started to see the data and understand the data and actually look at, at what was coming out of this study they all pretty much changed to well maybe there's not a parking problem here except for in those few nodal areas so that's that, that's why it was so great to have those local stakeholder groups and actually not just have a consultant come in and say, oh, we've done the study and here's, and here's what you need to do, but to actually walk them through. It was, it was, it was really one of those studies that, um, where the public participation really, really worked. It, just, it, didn't, it, didn't bog it, it didn't bog the process down too much. Uh, it really added value to it. It gave uh, the, the city councils got real pol uh, a, a more of a political understanding and, and mandate from it because they had business owners coming and saying we have this problem, so it was it was really good at, at, at that idea of public particip part participation. I have a few web questions. I'll do at least one of them now. Uh, were any different pricing options considered? Uh, and then maybe you know if they weren't, what, what do you think the business owners were would have been open to that? Or I, I think in these. In those two towns, there's no enforcement, for, first of all, and there's tons of free parking. So there wasn't any uh, short-term suggestion for uh, pay for parking. There were some long-term ideas um, to uh, fee and lieu, where developers might have the option of, of either building off-site parking or putting it into a fund where long-term it might go towards a parking garage. Um, there was a, an effort towards uh, metering was just just this not popular to, at, in these two lo localities. But in Gresham, it, they take the me meter money and put that into sort of the, 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 the customer first and the business association and, and, and that wayfinding system. So there's some talk about that. No talk of, of building a garage and 
pay for parking. That's just completely infeasible uh, in the short term in, in, in those types of areas where you have just vast amounts of, of free available parking. So, in the back. My question is, uh, sometimes it, it's really hard to measure the uh, parking supply. So uh, maybe some si cities, they just uh, think, uh, maybe I don't pro provide the enough parking lots. And uh, to limit the parking demand, I just uh, asking, is there, uh, have you think of uh, managing the parking in a, an another way, just um, uh, like manage the demand? Uh, I don't. Like that is part of that cu customer first policy and the, the the business owners that whole TDM idea I, and there's there's a long term effort in these areas I mean transits coming in uh, pedestrian improvements are there um, there there's a, a long term uh, effort to sort of have carpooling and more more bikes and more pedestrians but in the short term uh, and 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 I showed I showed a slides somewhere is like 89% SOV by, em by employees. So th there's an opportunity there, but not in the short term. And it, um, I, I don't know what else to say. Actually, related to one question on the web, uh, of whether any of the businesses were doing any sort of tie-ins with transit, like if you arrive by transit, you'll get a discount or a coupon, or trying to promote that to their customers. Yes, that that's part of that whole what I'm calling the 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 customer first. It's a a, a a comprehensive look at shared parking for for employees or shared parking for customers, uh, the wayfinding, the getting employees out of the prime spots, offering incentives to so employees aren't parking, um, the actual dynamics of downtown Beaverton and downtown Hillsborough in terms of economics and those customer bases, it's pretty much a destination retail uh, area. So a lot of, there, there's not a lot of transit use currently. Um, you know, we'd like to see that change over, over the long term, but you know, this study was mostly, let's look at the short term, say two to five years and then the five to 15 years and, and the, the, the TDM, the transit and the incentives are all part of those in the longer term but not in the shorter term. Yeah. Uh, it may be a related question. Both uh, Hillsborough and Beaverton have the light rail going through and I was wondering if there were any challenges that came up with uh, people parking and riding, having the car there all day, using up parking spaces that, you know, uh, retail uh, businesses might want. So the balance between retail short-term parking and then people parking and riding. Parking and riding is an issue everywhere where there's the LRT. Um, and uh, uh, Beaverton and Hillsborough have, have that problem, um, but there's not as much demand their, their actual park and ride lots aren't always filling up. Say Beaverton Sunset Transit Center, you know, that thing fills up, I think, by 7.30 or 7.45. Um, but that's not where the study area was. So uh, that is a problem, and, and it has to be addressed. And there's lots of ways that businesses, like in the Lloyd Center, they just chain off the parking lots until, I think, 9.30. Um, and, and so people can't, can't park there. So, so again, if you have that situation, it's, a, it's, a, it's, just be, it's brought in at the level of uh, now we have 85% of our available parking filled. Uh, you know, let's look at let's look at the turnover rates. Who, you know, how long are these people staying? Are they staying all day? Uh, let's do a little more analysis. It's probably parking rides. So let's you know let's let's figure that out. So it's it's just it gets brought in if you're constantly sort of monitoring your your, your parking issue over time. Downtown Beaverton is going to have uh, their new commuter rail station open up, um, and we'll we'll see what what happens. Uh, one of my plans um, was to do a, 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 an analysis around that uh, commuter rail station area, but I, I left Metro before I did that, so didn't get a chance, but good. Yeah. So we have a couple of related 
uh, a couple of questions that relate to the cost of parking. You mentioned that underground parking costs about 30000 per space, and do you have sort of an estimate for above-ground parking garages is one question per space. And then also, is there any sort of economic difference if, if, you, if a city does go the route of wanting, uh, you know, garage parking, is there any economic difference between sort of pooling and and building sort of standalone parking garage versus having individual having structures structured parking within buildings we've I, talked I, a lot I, about that in the um, context of of TOD you know should should you have the large central parking structure or should you you try to move it in to individual buildings my own personal uh, opinion is um, I like the idea of, of many smaller parking garages tucked here, tucked there. I think it creates a, a better urban form and it uh, pro provides a little more convenience, I think. So there's certainly some areas where a large central parking garage are uh, needed. I mean, Clackamas Town Center just, just built a six-story parking garage because they expanded their, their mall. Um, so you know, there's certainly times when it can work out, but it's among my colleagues. I would say that's a hot topic that's that that is actively being debated. The the uh, there's some the large central garage uh, can be built by say a city and then uh, bonded over time, so that you, you might be able to get one of those easier. But um, the private sector is am amazingly uh, cost-effective in, 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 in how they approach parking. And so you might actually get more smaller places cheaper in, if the private sector is building it as needed. So as far as prices go, you know, the, the tuck under is, is probably the cheapest form of, of structured. And that can be anywhere in uh, you know, $4,000 to $6,000, I'd say, per space. So still quite a lot of money. Um, when you move into, uh, say, a podium, now you're at more in the uh, eight to maybe eight to twelve thousand thousand dollar range, and then a full parking garage is um, well underground. You know, it's anywhere from twenty to thirty five thousand dollars a space, and and the, the a op highly optimized parking structure can be twelve. For so I've I've seen I've seen lots of prices, but it, it's twelve to fifteen is is, is probably a, a a good estimate right now is is what people underground is outrageously expensive, yeah. Yes, sir. At one point in demand, would uh, the different modes or the different types of parking structures work out? You know, like if it was a smaller one on the private side, at what point in the demand would those be penciling out versus like the larger one owned by the Well, municipality? it comes down to uh, how much, it, it, it comes down to what the market supports in, in, in terms of building type. And to build you know, an underground structure on a mixed use building, you know, you need to be getting retail rents of $20, $25 a square foot. And residential rents of a buck twenty-five a square foot per month, you know, which is quite a bit higher than what's going on in, in most of our outlying areas. Pretty pretty reasonable down downtown. If um, you know, it just it just comes down to economics. Are, are would you be willing to pay thirty thousand dollars so you could park your car if if you, if you were moving into a new apartment or a condo? I mean, that's that's. A lot of money, but there's plenty of places in, in downtown Portland where that pe people are willing, interested to do that. Does that answer your question? Um, I was thinking more, more related to uh, like, like the 85 percent. You know, like when are you hitting that point? When is the demand for the actual parking going to make it feasible to do some of the other structured options? I don't see this as, as re related. You can hit the 85% rule, and it says you have to do something about parking. And that may be aggressive TDM, carpooling. That might be um, 
structured parking, but to, just because you, you have a parking problem doesn't mean your structured parking becomes economically viable or the best alternative. So I, I, I don't see those as, as, as closely related. If there's, a, if there's always a parking issue and the economics are there, then you can start to have developers m maybe put into a, a, a pool um, where they either have to build structured spaces on site at $30,000 a space, or at, as Fee and Lou works, they contribute the equivalent of, say, $15,000 a space. They don't get the parking right away, but uh, down line when five or six years, 10 years, where everyone's having a problem, then the city can go ahead and, 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 and build that parking. That, the, yeah. that gets your question? OK. Anyone else? OK, well, thank you very much for your attention today. Thank you very much, Mark.